Welcome to What We Say Matters, using our words to lift people up. My name is Beverly Tomasian. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'll be leading this relatively short webinar today, but it's one of my favorite and I think one of the most important webinars that I provide. So it's so important that I offer it for free so anyone can jump in and review this content and information because we definitely want to get the word out about language and the importance of language. Before I start, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and are mindful that Diabetes Education Services stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta, and we recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land, the flora, the fauna, and the waters that run through this area. I also want to say we have an amazing staff. Our customer service and customer happiness team are here to help. We have Brianna, we have Tiffany. You can phone us, you can email us, you can chat us. We want to be available to serve you, answer your questions, help you navigate our website, and help you also with navigation with your professional journey. Our company is a value-based company who believes in inclusion, we are committed to promoting diversity and inclusion in our educational offerings. We recognize, respect, and include differences in ability, age, culture, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, size, and socioeconomic characteristics. Throughout our courses, we weave in inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. I have no conflict of interest to share. And what are we going to talk about today? Uh, what we say matters, language that lifts people up. And I love this image of the air balloon in the sky, uh, light and breezy and enjoying the beauty. And when we use language that supports people, that acknowledges people, that lets people know we believe in you, it lifts them up. They get a better view. So we want to consider words and approaches that can be left behind and describe language that is respectful, inclusive, inclusive, person-centered, and imparts hope. We're going to practice communicating about diabetes using phrases that are free from judgment with a focus on a strength-based approach. I certainly, as a nurse um, graduating in the 80s, we didn't use a strength-based approach. We used an approach called compliance model, whereas if I say it, you do it, and you don't question the healthcare professional. Um, I grew up in a time when the doctors would walk down the hall, we'd stand up so they could have the chair. And things have changed now where we recognize that it has to be collaboration between professionals and also between people with diabetes and their providers. The language movement really was kicked off about eight years ago when Jane Dickinson and Susan Guzman wrote this paper, The Use of Language in Diabetes Care and Education, which so beautifully conceptualized the la how language impacts our relationship with the people that we serve, with people with diabetes, and how adjusting our language can make such a big difference in people's ability to self-manage their diabetes. They created not only we now published their paper and also created this beautiful handout, a quick guide for healthcare providers, which I will include in your resources. So I just wanna go over some of the philosophy and, and what Jane Dickinson and colleagues recommend. How we talk to and about people with diabetes plays an important role in engagement conceptualization of diabetes and its management, treatment outcomes, psychosocial well-being. For people with diabetes, language has an impact on motivation, behaviors, and outcomes. So we know that there's four principles guiding this work. Diabetes is complex and challenging. Nobody asks to have a pancreas that is not doing its job. <laughs> it is nobody's fault to have diabetes. It's a combination of genes and environment. But yet, there's so much blame associated with diabetes where the person feels like it's my fault, I'm, I'm defective in some way. No, the person isn't defective, their pancreas is just not making enough insulin. Every member of the healthcare team can serve people with diabetes more effectively through respectful, inclusive, and person-centered approach. So the whole team needs to be on board with this. And I, I just have found in working in different situations that if I use inclusive language, language that is strength-based, my colleagues start picking up on that. 
And if they say to me, gosh, Bev, this person's non-compliant, they're not managing their diabetes, I'm going to help them have a, a new view of that. And I'll say, oh, you mean they're on a diabetes vacation? <laughs> and it's kind of funny, but it gets the point across that, oh, we're not really addressing it that way anymore. We're saying, what is stopping this person from succeeding at their diabetes care? Stigma has historically been attached to a diagnosis of diabetes, and it can really contribute to feelings of distress, feelings of shame, feelings of judgment. Now, when we have distress, shame, and judgment, it doesn't move us forward. For many people, it's going to close things up, and they may not be able to engage in diabetes self-management. Person-first, strength-based, empowering language can improve communication and enhance motivation, health, and well-being. Hmm. So if we kind of shift the way we are engaging with people with diabetes through our language, and language is symbols. It's the way we connect with each other. And of course, it's not just the words we use, it's our body language, our expression, our tone of voice, our attention to them. I heard, I've heard so many people say, it's so hard when I go to my provider because they're looking at the computer screen. So giving people our undivided attention alone is such a big gift. There's a lot of stigma associated with diabetes. And have you heard others using these words or phrases? That person is cheating or they cheat. There's no cheating, there's choices, right? People choose to eat certain things. People choose to move or not move that much. People choose to take their medication or not take their medication. There's no good and bad here. It's like, what, can, what, that, what is the capability of that person in this moment? Let's honor what they're capable of now and believe in them that they can continue at this current place and maybe even take a step forward. We don't talk about willpower. We talk about social determinants of health. What is in their environment that might be affecting their ability to take action? Um, train wreck, we might have heard these. Frequent flyer, non-adherent. We ditch non-adherent too. They don't really care about their diabetes. Well. We don't know that, right? We can't really say from our perspective if that person is caring about themselves. That person, we're gonna assume, is trying their best given their current situation. There's a lot of issues around weight. If only they would lose some weight, that they would be better. It would get their blood sugars down. But what if that person isn't capable of losing weight or maybe that's not a goal for them? Um, forgot their logbook or reader, doesn't take their meds as directed. Eats, this person's, I have had people tell me, my provider told me you're eating too much fruit. You're eating too much fruit. You need to stop the fruit. And is that based on evidence and science? Well, we might say, look at portions, but it's not a matter of not eating fruit. Fruit is so wonderful for us. Oh, that person loves sugar. So <laughs> these words and phrases, we can let go of them. They, we can leave them behind down the road and we're gonna walk forward with a new vision because we know that many people with diabetes have increased risk of early childhood trauma. We know that people with early childhood trauma have a higher risk of diabetes, heart attack, stroke as adults. Early childhood trauma affects the health of people in their adult life. And we know that socioeconomics and diabetes go together. People who earn less money and have less access to resources have higher risk of diabetes and also have more challenges managing it. Adverse childhood experience can lead to difficulties with injury. They have increased risk for injury, fractures and burns, depression, unintended pregnancy, communicable diseases, infectious disease, chronic disease, risky behaviors, and limited or less educational opportunities. We recognize that and we wanna talk about it. And I bring it up because many times it's under the radar. But if I have a person who's missing appointments, they're really struggling with their diabetes and they just can't move forward, I'll ask them questions. Oh, how was your childhood? And the first glimpse of their face after you ask that question gives a lot of information. There's also, screening tools we can use. And this website, acesaware.org is so amazing because it has free educational offerings and trainings and it has 
other handouts and resources, and it has all the ACE screening tools and a multiplicity of languages. So you can see that it talks about the science, training, screening, grant program, ACEs Aware Clinician Directory. And by recognizing that people who had a difficult childhood who, when they look at the screening tool for adverse childhood experience, score higher, and usually that number is four or more, they can say yes out of 10 that they experience these things, can definitely impact their ability to self-manage. So we wanna be trauma-informed. We recognize that a person who doesn't keep appointments may, them, may not be taking their medications, not adopting new behavior. They seem like they're huge, there's huge barriers. It might be a result of previous or current trauma. And it could be easy for us to say is, care providers, well, that person doesn't really care. Like they're not really doing anything. I'm, I'm not going to give them an effort. We want to dig deeper. We want to know what's really going on. We want to release, go through that veil of shame and say, gosh, I'm, I'm really worried about you. Is there anything I can do to help right now? So we want to refrain from accusatory, accusatory language, encourage collaboration, be curious. We're going to ask open-ended questions and we're also going to listen and observe and that i think is so important and that might be called mindfulness where we're just sitting and listening to that person observing their body language the words that they use and being very intentional in our approach and then what about us all of us come from different situations and we bring our situations to that current moment. And as healthcare professionals, we're trying to be objective and judgment free, but still y'all, we have implicit bias, right? <laughs> we know this. And we just wanna listen to our bias as it comes up for us. We don't wanna judge it. We just wanna kind of listen to our judgment language that might come up um, and be present with it, have a conversation with it and then see, you know, is there any way we could turn down that judgment knob a little bit? So we want to create a meaningful interaction, an interaction that connects us with the heart of that other individual. And I'm not saying that, you know, talking about diabetes meds and nutrition and all the other stuff isn't super important. It absolutely is. But what I am saying, and I just wrote a blog on this, is that if we bypass the emotional impact of diabetes, if we bypass diabetes distress, we are not providing the best service and care to individuals because studies have shown when we address diabetes distress, when we address the emotional impact of diabetes, people have improved outcomes, not only in their emotional health and well-being, but in their A1C. And that's from the Embark trial. The Embark trial showed definitively that addressing distress and connecting with that emotional component is healing and helps people engage more fully in their self-management. I wanna talk a little bit about terminology. Uh, terminology matters in medical communication about weight. Now, in the old days, we would say uh, obese, diabetic with you know, type two. You might use that kind of language. We're totally moving away from that because that person is not only defined by their body weight, it's just one aspect of who they are. It's not the definition of who they are. So if a person has a BMI of 25, and we could also have a long conversation about the utility of BMI, is it really an accurate measure of a person's health? Hmm. So we want to use measures of health that really do reveal maybe more body weight distribution, like waist to hip ratio or height to waist ratio might be better. So that's a whole nother conversation. We have a blog on that too. <laughs> so instead of saying um, a person you know, is obese, we say, oh, a person with elevated BMI, person living with overweight or obesity, person experiencing overweight or obesity, person with extra weight, person in a larger body. And sometimes we don't even have to talk about the weight. It may not be the most important thing. We could talk about their engagement and health. Weight is a heavy issue. This scale will only tell you the numerical value of your gravitational pull. It will not tell you how beautiful you are, 
how much your friends and family love you or how amazing you are. Yeah, just a number, but that number can have a huge emotional impact. So we want to take a weight neutral approach when people come in to see us. You know, traditionally we weigh people, but the ADA says we only need to weigh people once a year. They can choose to not be weighed. They can choose to give us a state of weight. We're going to go wherever they're comfortable. And what if they've lost weight? We're not going to make a big hoopla about that. If they've gained weight, if they stayed the same, we really want to not focus on the number on the scale, but their overall engagement in their health. That's what we want to talk about. Um, and if the person brings up that they've lost weight and they feel great, I'm like, yeah, do you feel better with, you know, with these changes in your lifestyle and your daily activities? How are you feeling in your body? I'm going to kind of bring it back to that so that the scale is not the only measure of success. So we want to encourage engagement and health promoting behaviors. We want to direct clients to practices that improve health rather than the pursuit of weight loss like if that's their goal i'm going to say great i want to support you let's figure out ways that you can you know pursue your best health everyone encourage body trust body acceptance free size and Margrit fletcher is an amazing author researcher expert in this topic area she's written books um, and her website mindful eating made easy is a fantastic resource so we really encourage you to check that out if that's an area you want to explore more. So setting goals using weight neutral approach, we could say, I will continue continue to care for my body by doing what? I will focus on small changes such as testing my blood glucose instead of daily weights. I will increase my self-worth by telling myself, I'm worth it. I'm good enough. I am just right the way I am. Let's do a poll question. JS is 17 years old and rarely shows up for appointments. A1C is 11.9. What might you ask JS? A, are you fighting with your parents? B, I'm curious about what is standing in the way of you making appointments. C, do you realize you are at risk for DKA? D, is there a reason you haven't been coming to your appointments? So let's do this poll question. What might you ask JS that's rarely showing up for their appointments? And we do have the captioning so people can review the visual words that I'm saying. So, um, I, yes, I hope that's not distracting, but it's really helpful for individuals. And as far as these poll questions, take a risk. Choose what you think is the best answer. And if you don't choose the best answer, it's totally okay. Because either way, whether you choose the best answer or a wrong answer, it's a learning opportunity. All right, I'm going to wait a few more seconds. I'm going to close the poll and share your results. So 100% of you chose the best answer. The best answer is I am curious about what is standing in the way of making appointments. Yes, anytime you see an answer with the word curious in it, it's a great answer because curious is non-judgmental. Curious wants to learn more. Curious says, oh, you know, I'm on your side. I just really want to know more about what's happening here because there's a lot of barriers to diabetes self-management. And if we think about what goes into a person's health, like how do they arrive at this place? We look at socioeconomic factors, their education, their job status, family, social support, income, community safety. That's 40% of what goes into our health. 10% is that physical environment. Do we live in a place where we feel safe, where there's a grocery store? Are we in a food desert? Do we live near a freeway? Do we live near parks? Um, do we have transportation? So, and so forth. 30% is actually our health behaviors. What we eat, what we drink, our activity, tobacco use, and 20% is our access to healthcare. And is it quality healthcare? So this is what goes in to our health. It's so much more complicated than this. We used to just really focus on their health behaviors. Well, they're not doing enough, that's why they're not healthy, but there's many other factors. And then if you add in diabetes to stress or other emotional factors to this, it can really be a barrier to that person moving forward. The other thing we really wanna consider is inclusive care for LGBTQ 
community um, for people living with diabetes. And I do want to say that members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community have unique health disparities and worse health outcomes than their heterosexual counterparts, which has relevance in the delivery of diabetes care and education. So diabetes care and education specialists are in a pivotal position to help this medically underserved and under-resourced vulnerable population to get the best possible care. This is part of our mission to provide inclusive care to all people. And I think being familiar with these terms can be really helpful. We have a transgender male that we serve in the clinic. So the transgender male, their gender identity is a man and their gender expression is a man. Sex assigned at birth was a female. Sexual orientation, who are they sexually oriented to this transgender male? Like we didn't have a conversation about that, but it could be men, women, or other. Um, and their romantic emotional orientation. So that's how, who are they romantically attracted to? Transgender, an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and gender expression differs from that typically associated with the sex they were assigned. And then cisgender, a term used to describe people who are not transgender, that is, who identify with the gender assigned at birth. So just getting familiar with these language and the definition can be so helpful and decrease our anxiety in serving people in the LGBTQ community. And we can mess up. It's OK. It's our intention that matters most. Make a quick apology and move on. There's a lot of great information on this topic that I would really encourage you to explore. Okay, a person shows up to the appointment, forgets their logbook and meter and tells you they're only taking their daily insulin injection about four times a week. What feelings would that evoke in you? So if y'all wouldn't mind typing in under the questions, what feelings would that evoke if they are scheduled to take insulin every day and they're only taking it four times a week? How would that make you feel? Would you feel like they don't care? They're non-compliant, they're lazy. We better scare them, exasperation, or is there some other feeling that you would have based on this situation? And you can type your answers in the question part. We have Mavis joining us from Atlanta. Welcome, Mavis. Thank you, Esther. Yeah. I'll, I'll just wait a few seconds to see what you all write. Yeah. Um, Esther says, are they struggling? So the first thing, you know, in the old way, we would go, wow, this person's non-compliant. They don't really care. But Esther goes, Maybe they're really struggling. Let's ask about it. Um, Annalisa says, what's going on in their life? Are they okay? How can I help? I love that. Right. So really kind of digging a little bit deeper, finding out what's happening. Is there anything I can support you with? Um, and checking out in more detail what might be a barrier. Kim says, oh, is there high levels of diabetes distress? Absolutely. So we could do a screening for diabetes distress, which the American Diabetes Association recommends we do yearly, but we can do it more frequently. And some people says, gosh, maybe I would, you know, there might be some exasperation and feeling overwhelmed. Maybe this person is overwhelmed. Maybe we feel overwhelmed because we're not sure how to help. And you know what? The person with diabetes best knows what they need. We just need to lean in and ask the right questions. And this is where actually curiosity comes in. And we're going to be curious. We're going to be non-judgmental. Oh, I hear you're, you know, I see you're taking your injection four times a week. Can you share more about that? Because I know we had initially discussed taking it every day. So I'm really curious what's happening in your life. Okay, we just set, you know, the table to say, I'm here with you. I'm on your side. I want to support you. And that can lead to a bigger conversation. Oh, gosh, in the morning, I'm so busy. I'm getting my, the kids ready for school. Um, and it's just so hectic. And it's so hard for me to get my insulin and remember to inject it. And then we could say, oh, would there be a better time to inject your insulin? Actually, could I give it at night? You know, it's basal insulin. We're going to say, great thinking. So now we're doing a person-centered approach, right? We're empowering them. And they came up with the answer. And we support that. It could be that they're struggling just to get out of bed in the morning. 
we just need to keep asking the question and we need to listen and we need to come from a place of acceptance like you all are mentioning so uh, what we want to let people know is i'm right here with you i'm on your side we share that feeling through our emotions and our body language we focus on the person and words are tools that can be used to encourage and focus on strengths. It does require awareness and ongoing practice. So we want to use language that imparts hope, is neutral. It's based on fact, free from stigma, respective, fosters collaboration, avoids shame and blame. We want to emphasize what people know, what they can do, like that person is giving insulin four times a week. Hey, you're succeeding four times a week. That's pretty amazing. How do you succeed on those days? We want that we we want to indicate that we are aware of them and their needs and their situation and providing a sense of dignity and a positive attitude. Our positive attitude toward them, our belief in them helps them believe in themselves. So the old way was, you know, we control diabetes. You can't control a, a physiologic condition 100% like you can't make the pancreas work when it looks like this, when you only have 20% of the beta cells. You can manage it. We don't test blood glucose, we check it. We don't call people with diabetes patients unless they're in a hospital setting. We call them people with diabetes, individuals with diabetes. Um, we've moved away from that medicalization because really it's a self-managed condition. We don't say, oh, your blood glucose, here's the normal range, because if it's not in the normal range, that person's abnormal. We move away from disease, maybe we talk about a condition. Let's do another one. A 78 year old tells you they stopped taking their blood pressure meds. It doesn't seem to matter whether I take them or not. What's the best response? Acknowledge your honesty and ask them to discuss with their provider. Gently remind them that taking their meds is dangerous. C, ask them if they are experiencing trauma at home. D, explore possible reasons for this action. Let me launch this poll. I'll take a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and show your results. So 90% of you said explore possible reasons for this action. That is the best answer. Some of you said um, acknowledge your honesty and ask them to discuss with their provider. Yeah, I love acknowledging the honesty and saying, I'm really so happy you shared that with me. Um, it's so helpful. But then if we say, well, you can discuss that with your provider, we just miss this opportunity to find out what's going on. So we want to find out why do they think it doesn't matter? Do they say, well, my blood pressure always seems great. And then, you know, we can explore that and say, oh, maybe your blood pressure, um, you know, is, is on target because of the medication and your lifestyle. Um, and then what happens when days you don't take it? We could explore that. So we're just gonna explore reasons for this action. Maybe they heard from somebody else that blood pressure pills are dangerous and they're afraid of taking them. There could be a million reasons. So utilize this opportunity to explore further. And the old way, old days, we would say, can't, you, you know, you can't do certain things, you can't eat junk food, or you shouldn't, or you don't, or you, you know, or you should. And now we say, oh, what do you think? Have you tried? May I make a suggestion? We're going to be curious. Instead of refused, we say the person chose not to. They're not a victim. They're a person living with diabetes. They're not suffering with it. They live with it. Which phrase represents the principles for communicating with and about people living with diabetes? You are checking your blood sugars daily. Your BMI indicates you're obese. Your fasting blood sugar is above normal. You should try and exercise 150 minutes a week. Okay, which of these supports the principles we're talking about for communication?
We'll take a few more seconds. All right, I want to close the poll and share your amazing results. You are checking your blood sugars daily is the best answer because it's affirmational. It recognizes what they're doing and it's just, it's fact-based. You are checking your blood sugars daily. And you know what? There's so much work when it comes to diabetes. So when they come in and we look at their CGM report or their logbook, we want to first recognize the work. We want to first recognize that they are making the effort to monitor their blood sugars, to write it down. They have the courage to share it because sometimes they might be afraid to share it. They might feel like uh, there's there might be judgment around their blood sugar numbers and they might be judging themselves. We want to create a place where people feel safe. So we want to stop shooting on people. Like you should try and exercise. And I want to ask you all, how else could we phrase this? You should try and exercise 150 minutes a week. If you could ask it in a different way or promote activity in a different way, is there a phrase that you could use or that you would consider using that is better than this phrase that is pretty hideous? <laughs> Anytime you, like we hear ourselves using the word should, we want to take a different route. We want to rephrase that because it's coming more from is from a more punitive you know, view. It's, it's not an uplifting way of sharing information. So I'll let y'all think about a different way to encourage people to increase activity and I'll, I'll keep going. So our coaching styles matter. Coaching styles that lead to behavior change include encouraging, collaboration, start where they're at, setting goals that are realistic and that person's gonna help figure out what those goals are. Judgment-free zone, you're safe here. And discouraging and judging not associated with behavior change. If it worked, that's one thing. But what does work and what we do know, what the data shows is recognizing that emotional distress, addressing it, and then using these other more encouraging, person-centered, uh, strength-based coaching approaches. And in our cheat sheet, we do have in our cheat sheet page a, a full document <laughs> that walks you through how to succeed with person-centered coaching. So you just go to our website, diabetesed.net, hit the free drop down, and then under free, it says cheat sheets, and then go to person-centered co co coaching. Um, and diagnosis of diabetes often carries significant emotional response. A person might report shame, fear, and guilt as they come to terms with their diagnosis and anticipate their future. As diabetes healthcare providers, we can learn to address these feelings, recognize them intentionally, and help people move forward. Mindful listening, reflecting back are so helpful for people living with diabetes. We don't have to fix, we just listen and recognize, support and per help with problem solving. The thing is our expectations of individuals weigh heavy on them. So when we label people, we form biases. And you'll hear this in your work situations where people might label a person with diabetes in a certain way. And that label can really stick and it impacts the way everyone will engage with that person. So we really want to avoid that and just focus on the behaviors they are succeeding at and maybe behaviors where they need more support. The person that is labeled, as you all know, may actually take on the attributes of that label. They might start owning it. And, and then our language choices might lead to that clinical inertia. We want to avoid clinical inertia where things just come to a screeching halt and use language and have expectations for that person. I mean, I work with people, I work in an Indian health services clinic and I work with a lot of under-resourced people, people whose life situation is so difficult. And I, you know, you might you listen to their story. If you were to read their story, you're like, how do they, how do they get through the day? But they are so resilient, right? People are resilient. And when I sit down and hear their story, recognize it and let them know, I believe that they can do this. Let's take a baby step. They integrate my belief in them and it increases their chances of success because we want to support empowerment. We want to help people discover and develop their inherent capacity. They have people have an inherent capacity. People are experts in themselves to be responsible for their own lives. So choices made by the person, not the healthcare provider, have greatest impact. People with diabetes 
are in charge of their own self-management and the consequences of, of self-management affects people with diabetes most. So here's something really important. When we relinquish, relinquish responsibility, when we really understand that we cannot make people do stuff. <laughs> we could be very optimistic and cheerleading, but ultimately it's up to that person. Then whether or not they're able to do that, it we are not failing if they can't. So we don't carry that burden home with us. If a person comes back and they weren't able to take that action, we're like, okay, tell me about the barriers. You wanna try a different approach? We're just gonna help them see it from a new light, pivot and try again. Or maybe they need a break. It's okay. It's not about failing. It's about that was not the right path that would work for you right now. Let's try a different path. These little flowers here, crocus maybe, uh, growing up through the snow. Look how resilient they are. The seed was planted, the earth is frozen, but they felt that sunshine warming the earth and they responded and they went right through that cold snow and made these beautiful yellow flowers. So let's provide that opportunity for people with diabetes to grow, to thrive, to try new approaches. Perfection is not required. Time and range is not 100%, it's 70%. Listen carefully and lean into their knowledge. Our words have the power to create and transform. And this connection we're making with people, this heart-to-heart -heart connection, listening to their emotions, we don't have to fix stuff. We're just gonna listen, be present, help with problem solving, offer support, and offer more resources if needed. But that human connection is one of the most healing things that we provide. I wanna thank you so much for joining us. We're here to help. If you have any other questions, please email us, phone us. Uh, our website is full of free resources and other information. Um, and we have other information on your resource page as far as the content that I've covered today. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll hang out after class for questions. This is Beverly Tomasian signing off.